Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Test Road channel. Today I'm going to talk about what makes a book great as opposed to just good. And one of the criteria I have is that I don't just enjoy the book at the time, but I remember a lot of details and ideas and concepts and images years later. The series I'm going to review today has a lot of those aspects. Having read three of these four books several years ago, I still remember them very well and was able to pretty much do a synopsis without checking the uh, Wikipedia or Amazon reviews. So recently though, I did finally read the fourth book, so at least that one is fresh in my mind. The series in question is the Fall Revolution by the Scottish sci-fi writer Ken McLeod. Ken McLeod is, as I said, a sci-fi writer from Scotland. Unlike some of these writers I've been talking about recently, I have not met him. Hopefully I will someday. As with many of the writers I've talked about so far, I got into his work through the Prometheus Awards, which is a pro-freedom award given by the Libertarian Future Society. There was a particular book called The Stone Canal, which people were raving about, and I read it, and I did love it, and I still remember a lot about it today. Ironically, McLeod is not a libertarian in the classic sense. He's more of a socialist, but he's kind of one of those uh, small government uh, kind of decentralization socialist, and he's not woke. At least, I don't think he seems like he'd be the type that would be woke, because already, back in the 90s, he was anti-green, <laughs> seeing them as kind of backward, you know, anti-technology people. So, it's kind of meshes a fair bit with some of my own philosophy. Now, McLeod's works are very political, yet they don't come across polemics, at least not to me. The political subtext is woven very skillfully into the story. One of the cool things about his world building is that he likes to explore different systems, even if he doesn't agree with that system completely, and uh, different ideas and theories. Libertarians really like him because he's explored the idea of an anarcho-capitalist world, which is a society based completely on you know, free association, uh, contract, and voluntary cooperation, unlike the use of force in government. And now he's also looked into socialist options, more of kind of a syndicalist view, which syndicalism means that you're into like the labor movement, that you believe in the primacy of the workers, which is okay with me too. I wouldn't mind seeing the workers have more, uh, more uh, say. Now, Wikipedia calls McLeod a techno-utopian, which I kind of call myself that. It's a viewpoint near and dear to my heart. And he's a lot like Vinji. He writes a lot of political stuff like him, but he's not a, exactly a mirror image, but he is a, a different counterpart. Like Vinji, he writes about the singularity, and he is skeptical about strong AI. In fact, he's against it. He thinks it's going to be dangerous to the human race. Uh, I do need to do a show about AI in fiction at some point, since I've actually worked with it. <laughs> so look forward to that. McLeod has a wry sense of humor that has lots of nerdy puns, uh, and I'll get into some of those later, but I, but I love them. Some of them are like computer science and security type puns, like you could say trusted third parties in the sense of a, of a party. <laughs> It may be groan-inducing for some people, but I enjoy it. Uh, his actual background is zoology, and he's spent many years as a computer programmer, like myself. Also like myself, he was an activist for like over 10 years. He was a Trotskyite revolutionary type way back in the 1970s and early 80s. Well, I was a libertarian uh, revolutionary in the 80s and the early 90s. Uh, so we kind of have that in common. He's written about 20 novels from 1995 to the present. Now, I'm going to go through the four books, the 
Fall Revolution series in order, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the book, first book in the next trilogy, which I'll uh, review at some later time. All of them have paper, ebook, and audiobook versions, so you can have anything you want at uh, McLeod's restaurant. <laughs> to make a little Thanksgiving pun here, the Star Fraction is the first one, 1995. Legend Books, and now published by Tor Books, the sci-fi giant. This was a Prometheus Award winner and a Arthur C. Clarke Award nominee. For some reason, I didn't read it until just recently. However, it's good in the sense that I was now familiar with it. Fresh my memory. Timelines around 2050, post-World War III. World War III was not the total nuclear apocalypse we expect it to be. There were some nuclear exchanges, but the world is still standing. Uh, in the interim, the UK, that is Britain, was briefly a republic, but as in Cromwell's time, it didn't last long, and the monarchy was restored. In this case, the restoration led to the creation of a bunch of microstates. All these different groups were given their own little area to rule, uh, area in England and Scotland and so on, Wales. <laughs> Anyway, they include like Christian fundamentalist groups, uh, Muslim groups, ideologues such as the Greens, and the anti-AI group called the Carbon Life Alliance, and even libertarians have their own place in a community called Norlanto, which is short for North London Town. As far as the world situation, it is ruled by the United Nations in a scenario that's very similar to Werner Vinge's Peace Authority. In other words, they have these orbital weapons that can destroy anything or any nation that they don't approve of. In particular, they have banned technologies such as strong AI, which they are very worried about. And they call it the US UN because in reality, the UN is the puppet of the United States. And a lot of people very much resent this rule and it's the theme of this book is a rebellion against the U.S. slash U.N., against that so-called rules-based international order, as they call it these days. The protagonists are this uh, Trotskyite mercenary, Mo Cohn. <laughs> I think he's probably writing it from life a little bit with this one. A libertarian teenager called Jordan Brown. He's a refugee from a fundamentalist city called Beulah City. And the uh, idealistic scientist Janice Tain, who's been working with technologies that are near the edge of illegality, and she's now running for her life. Now, Jordan Brown is named after the Italian astronomer Giordano Bruno, who was uh, executed for heresy way back in the 1500s. So I love these you know, historical and uh, technical references that he throws in here. Now, Cohen's father, who is now deceased, killed by the U.S. U.N. forces, he invented this uh, computer virus called the Black Plan. And it has been lurking in systems for years, waiting to make its move. <laughs> and it's led to a legend called the Watchmaker, which is like the blind watchmaker of Richard Dawkins' books, which references evolution, you know, the designer who has no mind, essentially. <laughs> and uh, in this case, it's the idea that computer applications and networks are going to become sentient. And that's what a lot of people are afraid of. Fascinating book. There's also one character called Jonathan Wilde, who's a libertarian philosopher who becomes pivotal in the next book. And there's also a character that you don't even realize is a character who is also very pivotal that you don't learn about till the very end. And I'll talk about this a little bit later. Second book, The Stone Canal, 1996, Tor Books. This was the first one I read because the libertarians loved it. It takes place after the Star Fraction, uh, late 21st and the 22nd centuries. This is a continuation of the Star Fraction's very fractured world where they have colonization through a wormhole uh, to a world called New Mars. And it, I don't recall, it must be like, very difficult to open these wormholes or hard to find good worlds because New Mars is not ideal. They have to terraform it, but it's a lot better than old Mars and it's got a better atmosphere and a higher gravity. So 
it's not quite as a daunting challenge, but this is where humans go through and they create a libertarian utopia with like humans and machines living in non-governmental harmony. Although they do have sort of a leadership there. Uh, and it's interesting because the wormhole is so small, they had to send like tiny robot ships through with DNA samples and uploaded memories and reconstitute the humans, kind of like, you know, dried soup <laughs> on the other side. And one of these humans is Jonathan Wild. Yes. And he, he discovers that the world is now led, more or less informally, by his old friend, now his enemy, David Reed. And they were enemies because they fought over a woman. And in fact, Reed was so obsessed with Wilde's wife that he made a robot copy of her or a, you know, artificial copy of her, which is kind of creepy when you think of it. Very stalkerish. She is what we call a gynoid. <laughs> She's a female android. Love the term because andros means man, right? So gynoid. So she is so unhappy being uh, reads property that she goes berserk and kills a bunch of people, which is not as bad as you think because they can be resurrected <laughs> uh, from their memories and their DNA, but it's costly, so they end up suing her owner for her damages. <laughs> and so we discover that Jonathan Wilde has actually got another incarnation on this world who was a robot who was helping to terraform the place. So we have the question, for example, what makes a human? Are they both Jonathan Wilde? Are they both his descendants? You know, how does that work? What is a human? Philip K. Dick talked about this, but he never really answered the question. So a lot of interesting aspects of the settlement of this world and the uh, disputes and so on thereof. Third book is the Cassini Division, 1999 Tor Books. Uh, this is one of those techno puns that I love so much that Ken McLeod is famous for. It refers to a uh, gap between the rings of Saturn, uh, or also in this book, it's a military squadron that defends the human race, which is very cool. This one, or not one, but this was nominated for the British Science Fiction Awards and the Nebula Award. It takes place in the 24th century uh, with this aforesaid solar system defense squadron operating near the orbit of Saturn. Now, they are here to defend human race against the post-humans in the planet Jupiter. Yes, they have infested Jupiter. Uh, they've uploaded their minds to these robots, and they've actually, you know, terraformed, in a sense, the planet Jupiter, made it weirdly more adaptable to their robot bodies, and they rule it as gods. And they are so far above the human race that they are willing to enslave us. They broadcast these radio viruses that will take over anybody who listens to them, take over their minds. And uh, that's one of the reasons that uh, Ellen Nguethu, who is the protagonist, she is the leader of the uh, Cassini Division. And she is this African Amazon warrior. And she's one of the few that's actually still worried about these Jovians. You know, people think, well, as long as you don't listen to their broadcasts, you're okay. Well, no, no, they... They are dangerous, and she knows that they have to be taken care of eventually. Humans have to protect themselves. It was a very interesting view of this far future society and how things have changed and how they haven't. Uh, number four, The Sky Road, also by Tor Books, 1999. This was a British Science Fiction Award winner and a Hugo Award nominee. This is not actually a direct sequel of the first three. It is an alternate sequel to the Star Fraction. And in this case, uh, the event mentioned at the very, very end goes differently. And uh, there's a disaster, and uh, human technology is set back. And it's been several hundred years, and the human race is finally getting back to space. And the central character is a guy named Clovis, I think probably named after the Arrowhead, that was a leading technology in the Stone Age. And his girlfriend, Marial, who is talking to him about history, about like all these ancient documents where they want to get this information out of there and actually help the space program and help mankind get to its rightful 
place in space, as I believe too. So it's a it's a very interesting book, and some of the alternate history is rather bizarre, like with the USSR coming back and incorporating the EU. It's called the EUSSR, which is what we call the EU today, a lot of us, because it's so undemocratic. Fourth book completes the quartet. I've read the first of the next trilogy, Cosmonaut Keep, published in 2000. Uh, but I'm not going to say anything more about that, except it does kind of follow in the same universe, uh, exploration of the galaxy, colonization, and uh, we'll finish reading the rest, and we'll talk about this at some other time. Pros and cons. First, the pros. There are some fascinating philosophies explored here, in here, and they're incorporated into the plots. And McLeod has this informal writing style that I really enjoy, and uh, he talks about ideas like what makes a person human. There's references to other works, to popular culture, and to science ideas. You know, like the Cassini Division, which I enjoy those puns. I mean, some people might find them grown worthy. I enjoy them. So it's kind of a wry sense of humor with interesting characters. You know, like, like Mo and Jonathan Wilde and Ellen and Clovis. Uh, now, some of the Aspects are very cyberpunk, but without all those tropes that William Gibbs invented and other people copied and worked to death. You know, the idea like the lone drug-addled hacker <laughs> or the completely broken society. This is a little different, which I appreciate. There's a great British slang. There is occasional sex, not a profanity, but not overdone. But there's occasional sex, but it fits into the story and it's brief and tasteful. Not over explicit, although, you know, if you don't like that, you'll have to skip it over. The USUN is definitely the bad guy, and it kind of accords with my view on how the U.S. these days is trying to rule the world unjustifiably, in my view. And especially, the great thing is that I remember elements of these books years later, the vivid descriptions, the original ideas. Definitely the mark of a fantastic series and a groundbreaking book. Now, cons, there's not many, but I have to do a few. Some of the predictions are hilariously wrong. You know, the idea of the USSR coming back. Um, some of the technology is kind of arcane, like talking about diskettes. Who remembers what a diskette is? They definitely won't have them in 2050. Um, the the uh, jihad war against tobacco has not succeeded. It's rather jarring that the characters can smoke in bars and stuff. I mean, I'm not against it. I'm not a smoker, but it makes sense that the owner of the place should be able to determine what the policy is. But of course, not in our world. <laughs> you shall only go one way, only one answer, you know? The philosophy can sometimes slow the action a little bit, though not too much. And some of the characters are tropish, especially the villains. Like in Star Fraction, for example, South Africans uh, are some of the villains. I hate it when a particular group is demonized. I mean, white South Africans, they weren't all bad. And there's a retrospective view on South Africa now under the ANC. A lot of that's terrible. And we can see that the black majority is now trying to get back at the whites, and just as horrible as anything that was done under apartheid, in fact, probably worse. Some of the characters can have kind of similar voices, which I guess makes sense when they're from similar backgrounds. You know, you can have a good narrator in the audiobook, and that helps because they do definitely different accents, and it was definitely that way in the Star Fraction. Finally, I didn't really catch the alternate timeline bit when I read The Sky Road, Maybe I wasn't paying attention, but it probably didn't help that I hadn't read the Star Fraction. <laughs> so as far as rating, now Wikipedia does a reference to one review in its, in its uh, article on the Star Fraction, which is a bad review. Guy gave it five out of 10 stars. What a fool. No, this is a almost perfect book. Five out of five gears. Uh, same with Stone Canal. The other two, Maybe 5 out of 5, maybe 4.5. Uh, they aren't quite as complex and nuanced as the first two, 
but still fantastic. I still highly recommend all of them. So this has been my review of Ken McLeod's Fall Revolution series. Please let me know what you think about it in the comments below. Please like and subscribe so we can help get out the good steampunk gospel and also to promote sci-fi works that I believe deserve more attention. Also, please check out my works on Amazon. As always, I will publish a list of links in the description. For now, this is Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos for the Steampunk Desperado channel where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary. Thank you.